welcome to AusBiz Asia. I'm Sarah Clark. Coming up, we meet the two Australian photographers in Tokyo who are snapping up the wedding market. The most time we get to shoot with the couple on a wedding day in Japan is close to 15 minutes. Um, I know that our foreign colleagues get 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes two hours. Um, so having to get as many images as they do in two hours in 10 minutes has definitely made us better photographers. Plus the energetic mum in Singapore who's made getting fit a lucrative business. And does Australia understand China? Well, we talked to the head of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. It's taken over as the gambling hub of the world and dwarfs Las Vegas in terms of annual revenue, last year turning over 46 billion US dollars. The former Portuguese colony of Macau is an extraordinary story of growth, epitomising the rising spending power of the Chinese and their love of gambling. With 30 million visitors flocking to the tiny territory every year, more casinos are being built and there's a construction frenzy underway to try and keep up. Riding this boom is a large group of Australians who are tapping into the jackpot. Every day is a busy one in this city. The buses continue to roll in, the ferries pull up, and the visitors flock to the casinos to try their luck. Macau's part of the most dynamic region uh, in the world economically, which is the greater Pearl River Delta region, taking in Hong Kong, uh, Guangdong, uh, and other parts, and, and Macau. Uh, and of course, the boom of Macau is on the back of the boom of the gaming sector in Macau, which has been phenomenal growth. Macau has grown explosively over the last decade and another burst is well underway. You don't have to look far to see a maze of cranes and construction. More of the harbour is being reclaimed to make way for another eight casinos being built on top of the 35 existing ones. And it's all to keep up with the increasing number of visitors. When I first came here it was mostly banana plantation. And within, what, seven years? just under seven years, they're developing uh, an amazing city there itself. Um, you're right, we're sitting on reclaimed land here, and, uh, and uh, sort of that was yesterday, and now we're building a, an extraordinary integrated resort, and, and that keeps expanding. Liviano Lacchia is the Vice President of Recruitment for the Galaxy Entertainment Group, one of the larger operators here in Macau. He moved here in 2008 to work for the Melco Crown Entertainment Group, the first casino of the Lawrence Ho James Packard joint venture. But he moved to Galaxy just before it opened and is now recruiting for the resort giant as it expands into its next phase. Yeah, it's a big job, it's an extraordinary opportunity. I uh, have the opportunity to run recruitment for this company. Uh, I joined, we were just over 4,000 people. We're now hitting 16,000. We'll add on some significantly more for phase two. Um, and my role is to help the company, um, support the company with their growth. Uh, developing talent, finding talent, developing talent, um, making sure it's the right fit to the company, the company culture. And what we're doing here is, is, is extraordinary as well. Macau is the only place in China where casinos are legal. While there's been a slight fall in spending amid a cooling Chinese economy and a nationwide crackdown on corruption, this gambling hub is still attracting the big money. Last year, gambling revenue soared to about 46 billion US dollars. By comparison, Las Vegas generated about six and a half. After seeing the opportunity in Macau and studying the development of Macau, it was an opportunity you had to grab with two hands because it's something you don't really see during your lifetime. Matt Helm is another Australian riding the boom that is Macau. He was the executive chef at Crown and then moved to Wynn Casino. Now he and his wife Nicole own two restaurants and are feeding not only the visitors but the growing local clientele. The clientele actually come from a lot of the casinos and also small businesses around this area particularly. Um, it can be from the House of Dancing Water, City of Dreams, the Venetian, um, Wynn, MGM and also a lot of the government companies come here as well. So we've got a very diverse uh, clientele which we're very happy with which is great to see. Around 30 million visitors flocked to Macau last year 
and one in five Chinese who ventured outside mainland China came here to gamble. It's driving a newfound affluence in the city as more locals capitalise on this rapidly expanding territory. Well, the fine dining market is, is only just come about. It relies heavily on the gaming from China mainly. They come in, they have a lot of money to spend. They earn points from the casinos and they can use that on F&B. Uh, outside of that, I think Macau as a society has developed uh, a huge amount in the past couple of years as the casino revenue has grown. Michael Keane arrived in Macau at 23 years of age. After studying wine marketing in South Australia, he was quick to identify the gambling hub as a hotspot for growth. The plan was to come out, you know, do a two to three years experience, go back to Australia and be able to you know, write my own cheque with another wine company. Uh, but at that time we saw the credit crisis hit, which really, you know, it put Australia back a fair bit on the wine side of things and also on the, on the growth. Uh, there was no one was really hiring back then. Macau, you could see, was always going to sustain it. And I guess the opportunities that Macau offers just kept me out here. And... He now imports and distributes wine to not just the big casinos, hotels and restaurants, but to a fast-growing local market with a taste for top brands. I think a lot of them are prepared to spend a lot more money now on F&B. Before it was just a simple bowl of noodles at night with the family and now they're starting to, to diversify their offerings and become more culturally aware globally uh, about wine and, and uh, the image that wine brings. So I could say they're becoming more sophisticated is probably the best way to describe them. And as long as the devoted gamblers and the visitors keep coming, so too will the casino heavyweights. And the construction here is showing no signs of slowing down. It's crazy. <laughs> when I first arrived here, people didn't believe how much came through at all and they couldn't believe the figures but as things developed the money's still coming in which is diabolical it's um, incredible to see. For the 2,000 Australians living here it's also an incredible ride. This territory that's open 24-7 has cemented its name as the Monte Carlo of the Orient. And looking at the frenzy of construction its gleaming future looks even brighter. Yes, I think you know Australians fit nicely here. I think they're, uh, we're a very embracing group of people. Yeah. And so uh, again, you know, we're sitting here in the middle of this extraordinary culture and this culture that keeps redefining redef itself and, and growing and, and, uh, you know, and the opportunity to sort of participate in that. I think Australians love the opportunity to participate in something um, and this is, this is why it's appealing to many Australians across the board in many industries. It has been incredible to watch and it's been incredible for many Australians who live and work there and for many Australian businesses that are doing really well on the back of that boom. As people the world over become increasingly aware of the benefits of exercise, the fitness, health and wellness industries are experiencing rapid growth. This is very much the case in Asia, where being fit is becoming more fashionable and people are spending more of their incomes on exercise as a result. In Singapore, Australian Lisa Clayton is perfectly positioned to gain from this. As the founder of the outdoor fitness company OzFit, she's now at the helm of a business that's going from strength to strength. Charlotte Glennie reports. At a time when most people are only just arriving at the office, Lisa Clayton's workday is well underway, and her version of the office is pretty alluring. Today, Singapore's exotic botanic gardens are the backdrop to Lisa's blooming business. Days are pretty crazy. Wake up around 5.40 a.m. for a 6.15 a.m. class. Um, do that, come back, have a quick brekkie, get the kids ready for school, drop them off, and make it to a nine o'clock class. And then um, typically that class is over at 10ish, so I'm home again to, to be with this little one while the older two are at school. Three. Four and a half years ago, Lisa founded Ausfit. The personal trainer and former events manager had moved to Singapore for her husband's job. She had no business experience, but the keen triathlete and former schoolhouse sports captain was passionate about exercise, and Ausfit was born. I was doing personal training here and um, 
loved doing that. Um, and a friend of mine here, who was also um, a personal trainer with me at the same gym, we were just discussing how much we really missed exercising outside. And we started Ausfit by um, getting together a group of friends, taking them through a couple of workouts every week with never any intention at all to turn it into a business. It was purely just an extra hobby to do alongside our personal training. And uh, so we started it and then organically, it's just grown to, to where it is now. By the start of this year, Lisa had 500 loyal clients, all willing to travel to locations across the city-state so they can sweat it out in hot and humid conditions in the name of getting fit. Most of them are women like her, who've left their home countries for their husbands' jobs. Found Ausfit, came along and potentially had 30 new friends. I used to live at Bondi, so exercising for me was always down at the beach or in the park, so the outside element is still here. Uh, it's a, a little bit different because the exercise that I needed to do was always before work, so it was 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, whereas now I have the luxury to exercise at 9 o'clock in the morning here. So the workouts are the same, they're hard, but they're good. But it's not only Australians who are drawn to Ausfit. Increasingly, Lisa says her clients come from all over the world. Today in the class there was actually probably a real small percentage of Australians and we have the Germans, we've got the, um, ladies from the UK, we've had some of the Americans here, French. Um, it's great that it's just becoming such a multicultural group now. Her company's rapid growth has taken Lisa along a path she never expected to be on, aged just 32. It's been a steep learning curve. Five. Initially, um, uh, there wasn't many overheads at all. We didn't have to rent any of the, um, or pay any fees to the, to the council here, as you would back in Australia. Um, so all our cash was being um, paid to the trainers. Um, and now the, the level that it stepped up, we had to form more of a structure. And um, we need to look at where we were spending our money and how we were going to progress to the next level. Um, and also because it had grown so large, we needed to, to hire a couple of staff to help with the management and the growth of the business. As Lisa's profile has grown, so his interest in her product. Earlier this year, she went into partnership with Singapore's largest independent fitness company, UFIT, and now the two run boot camps together, bringing their total clientele to as many as 800. Men take part in the sessions too, but most of the daytime clients are women. The bottom line for that one is they uh, usually don't have to have jobs. Their husbands or, you know, the, the wife uh, and, and the husbands are trailing spouse, if you like. Um, has been offered a pretty good job and they have a pretty good income and it affords them the luxury of being able to not, not have to work. So here we are at uh, 10 to 10 a.m. On a, on a Friday morning in Singapore and you've got 30 uh, ladies who are enjoying uh, a fairly nice lifestyle here in Singapore but, but doing some hard yards at the moment in the boot camp. A number of these women do actually work but often only part-time or flexible hours. In Singapore, it's also common for a family to employ a domestic helper, so women can outsource household chores and take time out from looking after their children. I do still work, uh, but I make sure that I fit my exercise in around my work. That's very important for me. The UFIT Ausfit combination boasts it's Singapore's largest outdoor exercise group, but by far the majority of clients are expats. The reason we don't have a lot of Singaporeans involved is they like to be indoors in the air-conditioned environments. The younger, fashionable Singaporean people, they're in the gyms at night, pounding the, the treadmills and the exercise bikes and everything else. However, the longer-term business plan is to change that. Darren Blakely knows the Southeast Asia market well and says the room for growth is massive especially in Singapore where the air is generally clean and there are plenty of green spaces. And you can see today it's a beautiful day and, and the guys down there are having a, having a great time. It's just nice to be outdoors in such a nice environment and there are some nations, some countries nearby that you can't do that in uh, for, other, for various reasons. But Singapore we can, we have a beautiful environment here. So I think the potential for this kind of uh, exercise is huge. Running her own business has changed Lisa's life dramatically. 
Life would be busy enough for this mother of three-year-old twin boys and another who's just turned one, even without work. Lisa says she's often doing admin late into the night, and the pressures of the job make it impossible to switch off. But the unconventional hours give her the flexibility to be with her family for much of the day. And to be doing what she loves with the rest of it, while at the same time inspiring others to share her passion for a tough workout. Two Australian photographers are making inroads into a wedding market that until now has been almost impenetrable to outsiders. The Japanese wedding industry is tightly controlled by the reception venues. A bride and groom hiring their own wedding photographer is not the done thing. But for this Aussie duo, they're not only breaking down traditional barriers, they're also being recognised on the world stage. Rachel Mealy has this story from Tokyo. We're shooting for 50 years in the future. We're, not, we're shooting for heirlooms. We're shooting actually for, for children that haven't even been born yet. We're shooting for those memories. Tracy Taylor and Dee Green met originally at university in Brisbane. Travel and photography became a shared passion. They didn't know it then, but a decision to base themselves in Tokyo changed everything. I just chose Japan first because it was a good base. Like we love Australia but it was a little bit far away and if we were travelling it just seemed great. And so the plan was to stay one year and 15, 16 years later here we are. <laughs> um. The pair started their careers in film photography and named their business 37 Frames because it was always an unexpected pleasure to squeeze one more frame from a roll of 36. I think that's how we feel about our journey here in Japan. There's always been like one little extra thing or one lucky shot or one unexpected something that happens when you least expect it. Setting up a business in Japan has had its frustrations for the pair who don't speak the language, but they say their business now has a Japanese pedigree. A lot of the good points of Japan have rubbed off in our business, which I think has helped us internationally because People perhaps aren't used to the same quality of service, but Japan's taught us that and given us that. Um, and we take that for granted now, everywhere we go here. After many years photographing expatriate families living in Tokyo, they began to edge into the Japanese wedding market. Life was good, we're very lucky here in Japan. It's safe, it's convenient, um, clients are wonderful. And then the earthquake happened and that changed everything. The couple's forward bookings for wedding photography were cancelled within days of the disaster. The threat of the Fukushima meltdown meant many foreign families also left Tokyo. It did also show us how the, we could, uh, the business wasn't as strong as we needed it to be. Right. It could, if, if something like a natural disaster can, can um, cause that much impact, we really needed to, if we were going to rebuild it here, we, we very much needed to change our marketing style and our marketing strategy and we were either going to go home or start marketing here towards more of the Japanese clientele, which would give us a little bit more of a stronger base. Yeah. And we weren't sure at first how we were going to be received. Since 2011, their wedding business has expanded rapidly. Now they shoot up to 50 weddings every year. They say they have a unique perspective which sets them apart from their domestic competitors. We're very different straight away and I think you have to either embrace those point of differences or it becomes a negative. So we embraced it, you know, we're blonde, we're foreigners, we're Australian, we can use that. But the work is not easy. Wedding shoots can take as long as 17 hours. Wedding photographers, it sounds like such a simple job. You show up and you just take some photos of everyone at a party. But it's really, you have to be part still life photographer for the details, the rings and the shoes. You have to be part uh, photojournalist and then part fashion photographer for the portraits. And part, you know, the, there's so many elements um, and, and not to miss anything. You know, uh, as a landscape photographer, I could wait a week for that one shot if I miss a bouquet toss or miss. And there's a lot of pressure and that adrenaline 
adrenaline rush. Um, but on top of all of that, we're also part therapist, <laughs> part wedding planner, you know, part something time always, keeper. part timekeeper. Something always happens on the wedding day. There's family drama. As well as family drama, the industry in Japan is tightly controlled by the reception venues, who usually offer an in-house photographer to document the big day. The largest frustration is that the wedding industry here is so controlled by the big hotels and, and the venues. And so archaic. Yes, that's mm -hmm. exactly the word. Sometimes when we do go to these big venues and work, we'll have an assistant and it's usually the attendant for the day and she'll be a lovely Japanese woman, probably in her 70s in a kimono, and she'll actually tell us where we can shoot. And it doesn't matter if the light's behind them and they're facing us and everything's dark, that's the point. And we'll go, but no, 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 that doesn't work for us. We're just going to turn you around here. Oh, no, 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 no. As well as this, the venues also control how much time they can spend with the bride and groom after the ceremony. Have to create um, magazine looking images in an incredibly short amount of time. The most time we get to shoot with the couple on a wedding day in Japan is close to 15 minutes. Um, I know that our foreign colleagues get 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes two hours. Um, so having to get as many images as they do in two hours in 10 minutes to create the same type of albums and stories um, has definitely made us better photographers. 37 Frames has won major international awards and been placed on lists of the world's best wedding photographers. To be really honest, we do enter um, the awards and put ourselves out there because Japan is so closed. We don't really have a... It was a bit more of a marketing network. ploy, you know. Yeah, there wanted... was marketing and also to see where we fit on the world stage as well, right? We wanted to be able to um, use the war words award-winning photographers in a way that actually meant, right. you know, something. Mm -hmm. For Tracy Taylor and Dee Green, it's the thrill of the chase that keeps them coming back for more. Dee actually does connect to the couple and the people that she's photographing. So she is really looking at them. But for me, I'm a little bit more technical. And so for me, the adrenaline, the adrenaline rush comes from nailing technical things and seeing light. And so having a combination of an emotional photographer and a technical photographer has, has actually worked very well. With China's economy set to be the world's largest within the next decade, competition to get a slice of this market share is fierce. While our trading partnership has focused on minerals, energy and agriculture, what does the future hold for trade in other sectors? And does any economic opportunity in China come with a political risk? I spoke to the head of the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, Peter Arkell, about the path ahead. Peter Arkell, thank you very much for joining the program. Now, the Australian Chamber here oversees more than 400 Australian operators in Shanghai. How does this city compare with Beijing and Hong Kong as a hub attracting Australian businesses wanting to set up in China? Well, it's actually 400 companies, so uh, there are many, many more people that are associated with that. So we've got quite a considerable Australian community living here. Shanghai and Shanghai is the, the centre for, for China's uh, business community and I think uh, the fact that so many Australian companies have decided to set up here makes sense and so we're a pretty powerful and well respected. It's a community that the, uh, the Chinese government, the authorities here in Shanghai talk to regularly and it's, uh, it, it's a privilege to be in that, that, that position. The Chinese government wants to turn Shanghai into one of the three largest international financial centres alongside uh, London and New York by 2020. Can you see this happening? If China said they want to do it, I'm sure I can see it happening. Uh, generally speaking, what they say is going to happen it has a way of uh, eventually turning out. 2020 doesn't sound very far away, does it? I'll go out tonight and there'll be a new building up that I didn't see this morning when I came in. So things can happen pretty quickly here. The free trade zone and other things that are happening in Shanghai at the moment are signs that uh, the central government wants this to be an influential and a trend-setting centre of China. And by 2020, this will be the largest economy in the world in any case. So I think it's a reasonable ambition. So the free trade agreement between Australia and China, the Prime Minister Tony Abbott has indicated he wants it finalised within 12 months, even if that meant signing a slightly pared back deal. What does Australian business need? I think it's not a bad um, plan 
both on the Chinese and on the Australian side to, to sort of set a deadline. I don't think it's weakened our position. I think that we'll, we'll end up with a, a, an FTA which makes sense for both countries. We can't diminish our access anything from, from that position, but we can always build up. And so they've looked at other free trade agreements that have been made with New Zealand and other countries since we began our negotiations. Andrew Robb, the Trade Minister, has spoken about, you know, these are like bricks going onto a wall. And now the wall is starting to take shape and we can see where a reasonable tra free trade agreement could be, uh, could be decided. We've talked a lot about opportunities here. Do those economic opportunities come with political risks? And how should businesses approach that? Of course. Sometimes a pitfall for people coming into, into China, the view may be that the streets are paved with gold and um, you really only have to go out there with a knapsack and, and pick it up. This is a highly competitive place, not just amongst uh, international participants, but with the Chinese people as well. We have to compete for our market share and we have to, we have to be smart and, and operate to our, our, our very best to be successful. You need to do the things well that you would do, do at home. The, China is a different market, a different culture, but good business sense is still good business sense. So if you plan, if you know what your strategy is, you know what your strengths are that you're bringing to the market. For me, I think uh, a key ingredient is being really, really focused, knowing what it is that you're trying to achieve. The minute you get distracted here, you can, and you lose focus, you begin to lose market share as well, I think. Do you think Australia understands China? Hmm. I don't think, no, unfortunately. It's a place, of course, that Australians are very interested in. You, you wouldn't read an Australian newspaper without finding an, a, a China story somewhere in there. Uh, I regret that a lot of the commentary that is, uh, that is uh, written about the way that China is performing at the moment, uh, what the business environment might be, what the outlook might be, doesn't always reflect the reality on the ground. If we rely too much on the, on the analytical reports that come out, which when we read them here, we wonder which country we're living in, because sometimes it doesn't always bear a resemblance to the, the, the market that we work in. Peter Arkell, thank you very much for joining the program. It's my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the program. Tune in next week to see more stories about Australians doing business in Asia.